team at the Fenzie outside of the White House, and I've been involved with them since 9-11, and uh, I will be going to their training facility in Maryland in uh, two weeks to provide another legal update to their SWAT and canine guys, and I was just there a month ago. So those are three of their pictures up there, in case you're wondering who they are. In the early 90s, when I first started doing canine defense work for a variety of agencies, including LA County Sheriff's, LAPD, and others, it was big litigation. It was consuming all our time. We came very close to losing our canine units. Uh, we had some sort of horrific injuries. The public was up in arms over what was going on with the use of police service dogs. And then we did very well. We settled some big cases. LAPD had to change some of their deployment policies, go from a so-called uh, find and bite to guard and bark. Um, but they weathered it, and they're now a very successful unit. Then it died down, and I was working on other things for many years. And then within the last couple of years, I've seen an upsurge in the number of canine cases, not only nationwide, but within my own world, uh, some of my clients that seem to have more than normal canine litigation. And so I kind of want to talk about what's going on right now, not just with canine, but also a broader perspective of what's going on in our country. And the legislation that's coming forth is quite scary. And a lot of it, I, I teach all over, as Don said, I teach at a local FTO school, sergeant school, and basic recruit academy for one of our local police academies. And I'm there at least three days a month. So I'm talking to, to, uh, to officers, you know, several times a month about what's going on out there. And I think we all agree that we're very upset at these legislative changes that are happening. But, but think about it. If we were to have tightened up our policy procedures and how we do things originally, we might not be in this position where we find ourselves today. So I want to make sure that we don't lose the ability to use dogs to search for, and if appropriate, apprehend them through a bite. But as I look into my crystal ball and I'm trying to figure out what's going to happen, I'm already seeing such a limitation on use of force that I'm concerned that we're not going to be able to keep our dogs as you are used to using them now. So I think it's incumbent upon us as a can community to start doing it ourselves and tightening up our restrictions. But let's go on. Obviously, what happened in Minneapolis and former officer Derek Chauvin has had an impact on this country like I've never seen before. I've been doing this for over 40 years now. Started off as a level one reserve officer here in Southern California. Uh, then became a prosecutor for the LA County District Attorney's Office for a few years. And then I've been defending law enforcement pretty much full time since 1990. So I've been, I've seen a lot. I've seen the evolution of, uh, of law enforcement. Uh, I've been through the Rodney King uh, riots here in LA, watching fires sprout up around my building, watching LA burn and seeing everything that's going on there. But never have I seen anything like I'm seeing now. The transformation of law enforcement through defunding chance and the legislative changes towards our use of force. And obviously this is probably the most hated cop in American history. My goal is I don't wanna see any of you end up with your picture on a high profile incident where people can say, wait, that's the guy that's caused us to change our canine ways. That's the handler that caused us to lose our, the ability of our dogs to apprehend through biting. I don't want you to go there. I don't think former officer Chauvin woke up that morning and said, hey, I want to go kill somebody and see what it's like to live inside a prison the rest of my life. But we know from all watching television that he was convicted on all the counts that were brought against him. He's not leaving prison. He knows that. We all know that. But it's not over for him because now the feds are filing charges against him. So he faces additional years of prison time because of one incident that happened in a moment of time has completely changed his life, the life of his family, and all of our lives in law enforcement in addition. We saw what happened with Dante Wright in Brooklyn Center, Minneapolis. This happened on a Sunday. I was there with Tuesday with Dawn and others. We were doing a canine presentation in Minneapolis. So everybody was talking about this. 
The chief of police came on the next day and said, this is a tragic mistake. It should not have happened, but it is a mistake. And what happened to that chief? The next day he was terminated by the mayor. The city manager was part of this press conference talking about this incident. And people said, when are you gonna fire this officer? And she had already retired from the, uh, the agency the night of. But he goes, I can't terminate her. I have to go through a process called due process. There are administrative hearings that we must go through to protect the rights of these officers. Well, what happened to the city manager? Next day, he was fired. So now this mayor has taken over and has implemented a variety of new policy procedures that are not being welcomed by the law enforcement. And I don't think Officer Kimberly Potter woke up that morning and said, hey, I'm in a mistake. My gun for my taser. I want to shoot someone over a traffic violation. But yet, where does she find herself now? Facing second degree manslaughter charges. And I don't think there's any doubt she's going to spend time in a jail cell for a period of time. The only question is how long, not whether if she will be going to prison. We have three officers in Tacoma, state of Washington, charged in the death, a positional asphyxia case. They all face first degree manslaughter charges, while two of the three are also charged with second degree murder. The suspect was heard on video saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I have many officers tell me, well, Gene, if they're talking, they must be breathing. And I asked him, what medical school did you attend? I don't recall. We can't afford to take the chance anymore. We need to call paramedics immediately, put them in a recovery position if that's what you believe. We now have to think forward, almost as if you're a risk manager, okay? We've taken this person into custody. We stop all use of force. We call paramedics immediately because we all know jurors love firefighters more than they love law enforcement. So we got to get them there immediately to provide immediate medical attention. Canine bites in particular, we need to have medical personnel there examining those uh, injuries. Well, Gene, he's got four shirts on. He's got five pairs of pants. I don't think my dog hurt him. Again, what medical school did you go to? Let's get the paramedics out there and let them make that determination or medical doctors. I'm going to play a video for you. Hopefully this works. And tell me what you think of this deployment. I have talked to several canine handlers in a variety of uh, classes that I've taught recently, and they've certainly give me, given me their opinions. Let's go through this for a moment, please. Listen to these conflicting commands and who is really in charge of this scenario and then why is a dog being brought into it as I continue. Thank <laughs> you. 
curious as to how many of you think that is a good deployment. They already had control of the suspect, in my point of view, when he was already prone down on the ground. They have him get up, turn around, pick up his shirt, then they put the dog on him and tell him get back on the ground where he already was to begin with. Then I see my supervisor get involved. Sergeants, that's not your job. Your job is to supervise. Our sergeant here is getting right into the mix of it. That's not their job. If you want to do that, stop being a supervisor. Then we hear the praising of the dog by the handler that if this case ever went to a jury trial, all the jurors would hear, good boy, good boy, you did your job. We all understand the need to praise the dog, but you really need to do it on a body-worn camera video that everybody's going to hear and see and question your motives. This is a type of deployment that if shown to a jury, it's going to upset them. They're going to be angry. This is a type of deployment where local DAs, depending upon your jurisdiction, may decide to bring criminal charges against all those involved for assault with a deadly weapon, perhaps the use of the dog. I don't know what the culture is of your particular agencies, how you view force or how you view the use of dogs in your agency, but you know that culture. And it's incumbent upon you to step back and say, is this something we do because it's always been the way we do it? Or is it something we do because under the law, it is justifiable? And can you now step back and say, just because we can do it, should we be doing it? Can we do our job better because of our local prosecutors take a look at this and decide this isn't good. We're going to come after these handlers and charge them. If our jurors and our civil cases are looking at this saying, wow, I think this is excessive force and render verdicts of millions of dollars. Are they, is that what it takes to force a change within your agency? I hope not. As many of you heard that there was a series of articles around the country last year and even going on now called the Marshall Project. And it's focusing in particular on canine units. I'm gonna play a video that was put out by the Marshall Project to talk about dogs. They are putting out a narrative to put police service dogs in the worst possible light to encourage legis legislators and members of the public to uprise against the use of police service dogs. We are going against a very well-funded, very well-organized organization that wants to eliminate police dogs. So I'm gonna play that. One of the things that's happening out there is that there are op-ed articles being written around the country. This one's called Fierce Canine Bites or Another Use of Excessive Force by Police. It was written at the end of May by DeWitt Lacey. I have cases against DeWitt Lacey. Most of them are wrongful death cases, usually involved officer or deputy involved shootings. But DeWitt works with a gentleman by the name of John Burris, who is based out of Northern California. He considers himself the Ben Crump of Northern California. But because Southern California is so ripe for law enforcement lawsuits that John Burris has opened up an office down here in Tony Beverly Hills, and DeWitt Lacey is running his office out here. So I have several cases with that firm. And this is what DeWitt wrote that was published in several newspapers. The controversy over police use of excessive force has been front and center in this pandemic year. The murder of George Floyd by former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, a number of fatal shootings by law enforcement officials, and the sometimes harsh treatment of Black Lives Matter protesters have rightly dominated the national debate. But the public remains largely ignorant of the damage done by another form of police violence, dog bites. Dogs are inherently likable, and many police departments have given canine, as these dogs are known, a starring role. Officers take them to visit children at school, celebrate their drug bus, detail their training regimen on social media, and when they die, their funerals meet all law enforcement honors. If the public could vote on a favorite police officer, the winner might end up being a canine. However, police canines inflict a staggering number of bites each year. More than 32,500 people were taken to emergency rooms 
in the U.S. for canine bites between 2005 and 2013, according to a study put out at Indiana University. Black people accounted for 42% of those wounded. Out in the field, the public usually misses out on what happens when a canine bites. The dog is routinely unleashed to hunt and sink its teeth into suspects who are running or hiding from officers. But sometimes it turns on innocent bystanders, and sometimes it kills. A country should long ago have ended this form of state-sanctioned mauling, which harkens back to the era of slave hunters before the Civil War. In a previous study, the researchers at Indiana University of Pennsylvania found in 2008 that two-thirds of police dog bites resulted in a trip to the hospital, a higher rate than any other non-lethal form of police force. As a civil rights attorney, I have represented multiple homeless people who bear the scars of police dog bites. I have learned that biting like all dogs trained behaviors must be continually reinforced in canines or they lose the desire to attack. My years of experience on these cases along with dog bite incidents in places ranging from Missouri to Maryland and North Carolina among others have also left me with the sickening impression that our most vulnerable population, people seeking shelter in abandoned buildings are sometimes being used as training dummies. In Indianapolis, police canines bit someone about every five days between 2017 and 2019. Last month, Indianapolis police officials announced that canine handlers would nearly double the amount of time they spend in training each month, and every canine handler and supervisor would activate, activate their body cameras whenever they deploy a dog. Police departments also now recording a message to be played on a loudspeaker during canine deployments, warning bystanders to go inside. Baton Rouge data from 27 to 2019 shows dogs routinely bit black teenagers, according to the Marshall Project. In February, the Baton Rouge mayor asked the police chief to institute a policy forbidding the use of police dogs to chase juvenile suspects unless they pose an immediate threat. The Marshall Project has found many police departments are using dogs for pain compliance, merely to make people obey orders from officers. That's like saying you should kneel on someone's neck to make them obey. That should be unacceptable. Seattle Police Department recognizes that and has led the way in specifically forbidding use of a canine to bite for pain compliance, and others should follow suit. That is a very emotional op-ed. It is intended for a specific audience. And I'm scared to say that I think that audience is reacting and it's not just the general citizens, it is elected politicians, it is judges. So when they get a canine case before them, I'm concerned as to whether they're already biased against canine. The Marshall Project produced this movie called Maul, short film about the current narrative conveyed in a short film created to bring awareness to canine bites. I'm gonna play it for you, at least portions of it, and you'll get an idea of this narrative that we're seeing that's being Repeat it. First in the op-ed by DeWitt. Now it's being shown in this in this short uh, produced narrative about police dogs and in other ways as well. So let's take a moment and watch this. Not to lose or something. 
I'm like, I'm just still out of the screaming. He could not get that dog on me. Once that dog got on me, he was like, he texted that blood. Oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. Like, he was just shaking me and shaking me and shaking me. And I was just hollering. a good perspective of what the narrative is of this particular short film they're equating the use of police service dogs with racism and when minorities are being bitten by police dogs and the handlers are caucasian the racial allegations are going to be made many of you now have body worn camera videos if used properly body worn camera videos will save you they will certainly assist in the defense of your matter, but if used improperly, they're going to hurt you. One of the things that we like to teach to all our officers and, and deputies, particularly those using body-worn cameras now, is you have the opportunity at the beginning of every shift to make a movie. You are the producer. You are the star actor. You are the director. And you, you alone get to choose the kind of movie you want to make. Are you going to make it a comedy? Are you going to make it a horror film or are you going to make it a true documentary of what you do on a daily basis to protect people from harm? You get to choose that. So your language. I have tried 48 of these cases in front of jury. If 
probably at least a dozen of those are canine specific related cases. I can defend one or two F bombs, but when it's every other word, our jurors and our judges are getting tired of it. California Post Peace Officer Standards and Training recently came out with a new manual on de escalation that talks about the issues of profanity and how it hurts law enforcement's credibility and professionalism. One or two F-bombs, if appropriate, maybe you used it to help de-escalate a situation so that you didn't have to resort to force. Well, then, yes, document that. Yes, I used the F-word for the following reasons, and it worked in attempting to de-escalate the situation. I was able to take the suspect into custody without any use being, uh, any force being used. Well, in that case, yes, that's a wonderful opportunity to use that F-word strategically and tactically. But just as we're hearing in all these videos over and over again, we're losing the support of our judges and our jurors. And right now, we need the support because we need to do something to counteract this narrative that's being pushed out there by a very well-funded, well-organized media campaign against law enforcement. They've already gotten rid of uh, carotid holds in many ways. They're trying to make our use of force standard from reasonable to necessary. They're getting rid of qualified immunity. Now the focus is on police dogs. Don't let them win. Your movie is going to be your body-worn camera video. That's how we're going to have to beat this narrative. I'm very concerned about this. I'm concerned about the ability of our handlers to show control over their dogs. I recently had a canine case for an agency that I'm representing where our handler was called to a domestic violence situation. I'm not a big fan of dogs going to domestic violence situations to begin with because as you all know in responding, when you try to arrest one spouse, the other spouse gets very upset and next thing you know, we're dealing with that spouse and having to use force. So as you all know, they're very volatile. Well, on this particular case, it was on an upstairs landing of, a, of an apartment complex. Neighbors reported hearing yelling between this couple. They thought there might have been some violence being used. So our law enforcement officers respond. They knock on the door. This young lady answers it. She looks like she's been crying and upset. The officers say, please come on out. We'd like to talk to you. Our dog and handler are there right next to the, uh, the door jam. Uh, where's your uh, significant other? Oh, he's right there. So come on out with us, ma'am. So they get her outside. They see the uh, the male suspect. He tries to slam the door. One of our law enforcement officers puts his boot in the way to keep the door from slamming. He said, come on out, talk to us. I don't want to talk to you. Come on, sir. We want to make sure you're okay. Let's just find out what's going on. And then they kind of grabbed him and brought him out through the doorway. Well, as he came out the doorway, the canine handler was right standing right there. Maybe the dog thought it was a handler protection situation, but the dog immediately bit that suspect. And then you hear on body-worn camera video the suspect screaming and yelling and the handler telling him, stop resisting, stop fighting the dog, which we hear all too often. He says, I'm not resisting. The dog hurts. To get him on the ground, and it took approximately 40 seconds for the dog to come off the bite. They eventually get the dog off the bite. The suspect's arm is severely injured. The local prosecutor chooses not to bring any criminal charges whatsoever against that suspect. Hires a lawyer and they bring a lawsuit. My agency did not want the video to ever see the light of day and be released to the public. We paid $1 million to settle that case which is the highest I've ever paid to settle a canine case. I'm going to show you an example here from one of our local agencies of a dog that goes in to apprehend the suspect. The suspect's fighting with the dog. The handler's going to call the dog back. He goes through an opening in the fence, disappears out of point of view, but then the dog, in response to its command, comes right over the suspect, right back to the handler, showing some control. So let me play this for you. Right here. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Right here. 
Dog came right back, did not rebite the suspect. One F bomb. Rather didn't happen, but I could probably defend that one F bomb because it got the guy to quiet down and now he puts his hands up and they're able to take him into custody without any force being used. Let's talk about what's going around this country. And I'm looking forward to uh, Steve White talking about what's going on in the state of Washington because it's a national issue that we must address no matter where you're working right now your state if it hasn't already is certainly considering some legislative changes to the use of force so for example new jersey issues sweeping changes to when police officers can use force and it's actually protecting criminals they're barred from using physical or deadly force against civilians except as a last resort officers are also required to intervene if they see another officer going too far so this Failure to intervene and stop other officers from using excessive force is another topic that's being pushed nowadays. New Jersey Attorney General said this is the first overhaul of the state's use of force policy in 20 years. They want to preserve the sanctity of human life. They're going to preserve the rights and liberties of their residents. And they're going to try to resolve every interaction in a peaceful and respectful manner. But the rules prohibit officers from using force to speed up an arrest. Ban the use of police dogs on suspects who are only resisting arrest and require departments review every incident where force is used. There's now a national registry to track police misconduct and it's being tested here in Los Angeles. This is part of the George Floyd policing law that has passed the House of Representatives and it's now pending in the U.S. Senate. This is the bill that deals with the elimination of qualified immunity. But part of that legislation is coming up with a national registry. A new effort to bring transparency and accountability to law enforcement is in development at University of California Safe Communities Institute. It's called the Law Enforcement Work Inquiry System, or Lewis Registry. It's named after the late Georgia Congressman and civil rights leader, John Lewis. The Lewis Registry is believed to be the first comprehensive national catalog, catalog of police officers who have been terminated or resigned due to misconduct. The registry is going to use public records to document details of police officer misconduct. It's designed to prevent cops who have been fired or have resigned from getting rehired at another police department. The registry will document details such as excessive use of force, corruption, domestic violence, sexual assault, harassment, perjury, hate group affiliation, or filing a false police report. Even if you are subject to an unfounded or a non-sustained complaint where you are exonerated, that complaint still will go in this national database that will be searchable by anybody to be used against you. We're already seeing in California databases pop popping up, one's called prosecutekillercops.org, where if you're a law enforcement officer who have been involved in a shooting and have killed somebody, as much information about you would be put on this website, your photo, what agency you work for, your badge number, how much you earn since that's public information. And if they can find your home address, that will also be put on that website. And you can imagine the security and privacy issues that are risk there. This is becoming 
a reality. Let's go through some history to talk about just how expensive all of this is. So March, we had Rodney King of 1991. Then went Amadou Diallo. We had Eric Garner, the original I Can't Breathe. Michael Brown and Ferguson, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, Andres Guardado, Anthony McClain, Jacob Blake, Daniel Prude, Dijon Kesey, Dante Wright, to name some of the more high-profile incidents around this country. There's nothing new here. We have been through this. The only thing different is that the price has now gone up, and you'll see just how expensive this becomes. So I've done some research and kind of came up with some values to some of these cases. Rodney King went through a jury trial. They rendered $3.8 million, not including attorney's fees. Amadou Diallo was a settlement of $3 million. Eric Garner was almost $6 million. Michael Brown was $1.5 million. Freddie Gray was a $6.4 million settlement. Breonna Taylor, $12 million. George Floyd, $27 million. Dante Wright, I don't know how much that's going to cost. But we can see the cost is going up and up. But then we add the cost of looting and protest, the cost of overtime, injured officers, so the IOD status and what that's going to cost in workers' comp cases, defunding law enforcement, what the cost has been of that when people realize it's a disaster. Now they're trying to rehire cops, but they're not going to be able to. Retirement resignation costs and, of course, the litigation costs. So you can see each one of these cases is actually worth tens of millions of dollars, and it's only going up. So what's use of force? While you get to use force that is reasonably necessary to effect an arrest, overcome resistance, and prevent escape. Unreasonable force is situations where you use more than the minimum amount reasonably necessary to defuse an incident or to protect yourself and others from harm. Talk about Graham versus Connor because this came out in 1989. We all refer to it. We're all tra trained on it. And you all should be able to cite Graham versus Connor. And it talks about some very important factors that you all need to know, particularly when evaluating use of force. Number one, how is this person immediate threat to the safety of officers and or others that would justify the use of a dog, for example? Are they actively resisting versus passively resisting? And of course, in canine situations where they're hiding under a car or hiding under a house or under a bush, we're going to argue that's actually tactically actively resisting because they have night vision. They know where you are, but you don't know where they are. They know what they're about to do. You don't know. So that allows us to use a dog in many tactical situations. But the plaintiffs will argue, well, excuse me, they were hiding under the car. Were they throwing rocks at you? No, they weren't. Were they spitting at you? No, they weren't. Were they shooting at you? No, they weren't. Were they making fun of your mother? No, they weren't. Isn't it true, officer? They were just hiding under the car. And then they argue to the jurors that that's just passively resisting. And of course, we have to come back and show the tactical issues involved in dealing with someone who's hiding underneath the car. Getting back to Graham versus Connor, why are we there in the first place? I don't like misdemeanor deployments unless there's a, a, a gun involved. But the severity of the crime at issue is certainly going to be a very important factor. And this is a person attempting to evade arrest by fleeing, by fighting and or hiding. And again, when it comes down to your deployment policy, I don't care if you're fight and bite, guard and bark, or sit and piss. It makes no difference to me. I have never had to litigate those issues in all the cases I have handled over the years. What is important is, is this a reasonably justifiable use of force under Graham versus Connor? That's what I argue. And this is the, the language that we use to argue on your behalf. The reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on scene rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight. But we are losing this. Some of the legislation that's going forward wants to eliminate this so that we do get second guessed. With respect to a claim of excessive force, the same standard of reasonableness at the moment applies. Not every push or shove, even if it may later seem unnecessary in the peace of a judge's chambers, necessarily violates the Fourth Amendment. The calculus of reasonableness must embody allowance for the fact that the police officers are often forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense 
uncertain and rapidly evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation. This is one of our favorite arguments. We're making split second judgments in rapidly evolving situations. Don't second guess us. But guess what? We're losing this. And I think Scott may be able to address this when he gets on and talks. Five years ago, Perf came out with this critical issues in policing series, use of force, taking policing to a higher standard. This was January 29th of 2016, and they came out with these 30 guiding principles. We fought back on behalf of law enforcement, but I have to admit, I was too naive to realize what exactly what was happening. Perf was setting the stage along with other organizations to take Graham versus Connor to a different level. That they are putting out this narrative that you can no longer rely on Graham, that it's not enough. This is actually what came out. Departments should adopt policies that hold themselves to a higher standard than legal requirements of Graham versus Connor. Agency use of force policy should go beyond the legal standard of objective reasonableness outlined in the 1989 U.S. Supreme Court decision of Graham v. Connor. This landmark decision should be seen as necessary, but not sufficient, because it does not provide police with sufficient guidance on the use of force. As a result, prosecutors and grand jurors often find that a fatal shooting by an officer is not a crime, even though they may not consider the use of force proportional or necessary. So I apologize to everybody. I should have picked up on this five years ago, because now we see these words proportional or necessary in all this legislation coming forward. Agencies should adopt policies and training to hold themselves to a higher standard based on sound tactics, consideration of whether the use of force was proportional to the threat and sanctity of human life. So imagine those agencies that are going to a higher standard. You can be disciplined for violating your own policy. But yet, if you're sued for excessive force, the court's probably going to use the Graham versus Connor standard. How is that going to be presented? Then the series of articles came out in the New York Times. This was just this past April, showing, again, this progressive move to try to convince politicians and judges that law enforcement needs to move beyond Graham versus Connor. And this article is entitled Split Second Decisions. How a Supreme Court case shaped modern policing. Officers using deadly force relied on legal doctrine set forth decades ago. Now the movement launched by the death of George Floyd is trying to change that standard. So again, this narrative is being pushed out through our media so that people read about it and start adopting it. In case after case, it took only a split second for an officer to pull the trigger. Adam Toledo, a 13-year-old Chicago, had tossed away a handgun and begun raising his hands. Micaiah Bryant, a 16-year-old Columbus, Ohio, lunged with a knife at another teenager. Terrell Wilson, a 33-year-old mentally ill homeless man in California, had a knife in hand when he shot and killed me at an approaching deputy sheriff. All three of these were among more than 100 people shot and killed by police over just a previous six-week period of time. The officer's justification for the use of lethal force in each instance differs with the circumstances, but... As in almost every other recent case involving questions of police use of force, law enforcement officials defending the officers are relying on a doctrine set forth by the Supreme Court three decades ago and now deeply ingrained in police culture that judges and juries should not second guess officers' split second decisions, no matter how unnecessary a killing may appear in hindsight. And there we are. We need to change a 30 year old case and judges and jurors should be allowed to second guess your decision-making process, even though they were not present on that day or night of when the incident occurred. And I find that very concerning for you. Now, after the uproar over the Floyd killing, many state and federal lawmakers are trying to impose new restrictions on the use of force. Maryland has passed a law over the objections of their own governor requiring that any such actions must be Necessary and proportional. Again, that's the language we saw five years ago in PERF, and now we're seeing more and more. To prevent an imminent threat of physical injury or to achieve a legitimate law enforcement objective. And if you violate this rule, you can be sentenced up to 10 years. 
if you were convicted in a criminal case. Wow. Does anybody else find this scary? California, Illinois, and other state legislatures have debated, debated similar measures. And the House of Representatives last year passed its own bill, raising standards for the use of force and requiring attempts at de-escalation. And again, that passed the House. It's now pending in the U.S. Senate. And they're arguing over, should we eliminate qualified immunity? I think they're going to adopt the other provisions, but qualified immunity right now is the sticking point. And I hope to goodness that we do not lose that defense because we need it. This is what it is. Section 102 would eliminate qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. The bill would overrule the judicial doctrine of qualified immunity and make it easier for a police officer to become a defendant in a 42 U.S.C. 1983 federal civil rights lawsuit. What they're also thinking of doing is amending the mens rea state of mind requirements in the criminal statute, which is 18 U.S.C. Section 242, from a willfulness to a recklessness standard, lowering the threshold, making it easier to criminally prosecute you for a crime. 364 would modify the use of force standards. They want to ban federal officers from using deadly force except as a last resort to prevent imminent and serious injury or death to the officer or another person. Can only use deadly force after exhausting all other reasonable alternatives and in a way that does not create a substantial risk of injury to a bystander. For those of you who are part of federal task forces, are you going to be held to this new standard if it passes? You might very well be. Section 201 creates that National Police Misconduct Registry that I just talked about that's already in existence. I think approximately 300 people or 300 officers are already included in that database and more will be added from around the country. Qualified immunity is huge. It's a defense that we try to use as often as we can. And depending where you are in the country, some courts are more inclined, inclined to grant it more readily. Fifth Circuit, the Texas area, for example, Sixth Circuit's pretty good. Then versus the Ninth Circuit, which fights us tooth and nail to give qualified immunity. But basically, qualified immunity allows us to argue that there was no case on point that would allow our officers or deputies to know that what they were doing was wrong. For example, if you deploy your dog in a suspect who is surrendering, you're not going to get qualified immunity because you know that is wrong. But if there's some kind of such an unusual circumstance that there's no reported case on it, that's the type of situation where qualified immunity is appropriate. Supreme Court last year had nine cases on its docket perhaps to determine whether or not to grant qualified immunity in a variety of cases from around the country. One of them was mine. Supreme Court chose not to hear any of those cases. They're all listening to the same news reports and reading the same articles that we are. I think they're waiting for a different type of case, probably one involving a social worker, for example, because qualified immunity applies to all government officials, not just law enforcement, which of course the media neglects to mention. And there's a case out of San Diego County that they're trying to get in front of the U.S. Supreme Court where it would deal with the qualified immunity for a social worker. That might be the case I think our U.S. Supreme Court would take up because it's not political in the sense that it involves law enforcement. Instead, it's a social worker, and they can uphold the principles of qualified immunity in that type of case, which would allow us to still use it in our law enforcement cases. So we got to wait and see what's going to happen and what our, what our Supreme Court's going to do. Let me move on through here. Maryland's one of the first states that completely overhauled their use of force and repealed all police officers' Bill of Rights. It raises the bar for an officer to use force. It gives civilians a role in police discipline for the first time. It restricts no-knock warrants, it mandates body cameras, and opens some allegation of police wrongdoing for police for public review. They wanted it to go further. They didn't get it, but it's still going to be pretty restrictive on law enforcement. It imposes one of the strictest police use of force standards in the nation, requires officers to prioritize de-escalation tactics, 
and imposes a criminal penalty for those found to have used excessive force. Well, that's scary. New York City ends qualified immunity for their police officers. They are no longer going to be allowed to argue it as a defense. Colorado has eliminated qualified immunity. Connecticut has uh, eliminated qualified immunity. New Mexico has eliminated qualified immunity. Here's an example of even how you name your police dog may create emotional thoughts. Oregon Police Department changes canine's name, Lil' Kim, after controversy. So the Bend Police Department, Oregon, had one of its police dogs named Lil' Kim. And they had to change the name over the fact that it shares a name with a Grammy award-winning rapper named Lil' Kim. The founder of the Central Oregon Black Leaders Assembly said in a video that he met with the police chief to express concerns about the dog's name. It's a tiny little black dog, canine dog, that the police call Lil' Kim. If you're a person of color, if you're a fan of Lil' Kim, you know her significance in hip-hop. You also know that she's a gangster rapper, he said in the video. Just to be honest, I don't want to see Lil' Kim out there biting people of color. Again, trying to establish that the use of police service dogs and even how they're named it may have a racial overtone to it being used to help eliminate police service dogs. So Chief Krantz of the police department said it was never named after the, rap after the rapper, but they have agreed to change the na name to just Kim now because they want to avoid controversy. Talk about New Mexico. There's an investigation going on right now here in Southern California, well, actually throughout California, and a civil rights group is calling for an end to the use of police dogs. Their analysis found that at least 14% of cases involving police dogs, officers describe suspects as passively not complying with orders, justifying their use of the dog. This is a case that DeWitt Lacey is handling against this local police department. And again, he's the one that wrote that op-ed earlier that I, I pointed out. Maureen Frosto struggles with simple tasks like buttoning her pants after an arrest involving a police canine last year seriously damaged her left arm. Her experience is among the growing number of instances that has civil rights groups calling for an end to the use of police dogs to apprehend suspects during arrests. The West Covina Police Department also reported the third highest number of incidents per 100,000 people out of every city agency statewide reporting more than one incident. Only two departments in Northern California reported a higher rate of incidents than the West Covina Police. Richmond PD, which reported 17.4 incidents per 100,000 people, and Vacaville PD, which reported 10.2 incidents per 100,000 people. Using information provided to the DOJ by law enforcement agencies around the state regarding incidents involving force and resulting serious injury or death, Eyewitness News has identified 309 incidents involving police dogs over a three-year period of time from 2016 to 2019. Their analysis shows incident resulting in injury or death involving canine officers represented about 11% of the total use of force incidents resulting in serious injury or death reported by law enforcement agencies statewide. That's a little misleading because I'm not aware of anybody in the state of California in the years that I've been doing this that have ever died directly as a result of a canine bite. Na nationwide, I'm aware of maybe less than a handful of suspects who have actually died directly because of a police dog bite. The famous case of Robinette versus Barnes, Laura McLeod versus City of West Palm Beach, Florida. There's an argument whether she died because of medical negligence as opposed to the dog bite because of contributory, uh, contributory uh, allegations of cirrhosis of the liver and not being treated by the doctors quickly. Very rare, but yet, according to the CDC, at least 10 people on average die every year from non-police dog bites. Now, of course, the other side will argue, well, they're the very young or the very old, but still more people die per year by non-police dog bites that have ever been killed by an actual police dog. So those stats are a little misleading. Quoting from our post office, the officer's use of force must be proportionate given the totality of the circumstances. It's not proportionate if a less injurious alternative existed and could be safely employed. 
And then they talk about PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum for May 2020, saying that when possible, handlers should consider alternative tactics before deploying a canine. They're after your dogs. They're going to try to get them eliminated. Our new attorney general in California does not appear to be pro-police canine. And these types of articles, this type of narrative going nationwide is not going to end well for our dogs, which is why I say we as law enforcement need to tighten up quickly or we're going to lose these dogs. And of course, you've all heard what's going on with Salt Lake City and now their handlers some of them are being criminally charged now with assault with a deadly weapon through the use of their dog. The canine unit has been disbanded. I'm going to play one video, and then I'm going to turn it over to my fellow speakers so I don't go on too far, but to give you an idea of what's going on in the media attention for Salt Lake City. A police officer in Salt Lake City is suspended and under investigation for a vicious attack on a black man involving a police dog. Video has surfaced of the altercation that took place in the man's own yard. And we warn you, it's disturbing. Here's CBS's Carter Evans. Get on the ground and you're going to get bit. Just six seconds after that warning, this Salt Lake City police officer commands his cane to attack. Every time the officer says hit, the dog bites down on 36 year old Jeffrey Ryan's leg in his own backyard. <laughs> Ryan's attorney, Dan Barter, is he resisting at all? No, no. I, even when the dog starts to bite him, he's, he's still just laying there. Looks like someone took a chainsaw to his leg. Police were responding to a domestic disturbance call and say Ryan's was violating a protective order filed by his wife, but Ryan says the order was supposed to be lifted. The Salt Lake City Canine Program will now undergo an external review, and Deputy Chief Jeff Kendrick told us they're limiting the use of police dogs during that time. We just deploy them just for searches, but we do not want them to come in contact with uh, any individuals. Jeffrey Ryans is still recovering from multiple surgeries, and an amputation has not been ruled out. Carter Evans, CBS News, Los Angeles. That's part of the narratives going on. Two incidents just happened recently that come to my mind. It was National Night Out last week here in uh, Southern California, as it was probably in many places around the country. A police department uh, in the city right next door to me had their canine at the National Night Out celebration. A blind, I think five-year-old child went to the dog to pet it, and the dog bit the child in the face. There have been numerous articles regarding this incident. I think Steve had a similar situation that happened that, uh, up in the state of Washington that he's aware of. And when the same time that that article came out in the local Los Angeles Times, there was also another article that in July, a police officer who had his former police dog from another agency, the dog was retired, and he was trying to get his current agency to start a canine unit, and he wanted to use his retired dog got out from his fence along with his other pet dog and they attacked an elderly couple walking on the beach in this particular area up in central california the gentleman died as a result of his canine injuries the family obviously brought a lawsuit and the jurors returned a verdict of 20 million dollars because of that wrongful death case caused by a retired police dog which raises all kinds of issues about how you should treat your retired dogs, what kind of settlement or release agreements you should engage in. But this is this national narrative. And you probably think, God, Gene, you're all doom and gloom. Well, I apologize to some extent, but I want to make sure everybody's attention is, is focused on the fact that we don't want to lose our dogs. We don't want to lose the ability to use them to apprehend when it's appropriate. And I'm fighting very hard for you. The USPCA is fighting very hard for you so that we maintain our dogs. But I'm concerned that there are some agencies out there that think it's appropriate to deploy whenever and however they want, and that's what we need to change, and that's what I'm trying to do. So I apologize for going so long. I don't want to interfere with my 
fellow co-speakers here, but I'll be available for any questions or anything I could do to help you. Thank you for what it is you do. And even though it may not seem like it, there are several people out there that do support law enforcement. And I am seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm seeing agencies getting higher salaries for their officers. I see the state of Georgia trying to pass legislation to give all their first responders a thousand dollar bonus. I see other agencies doing the same thing to support their law enforcement. And I'm seeing a campaign to refund law enforcement as opposed to defund because we realize it's not working and the people realize they need you to protect them. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to, I think, Steve White. So thank you, Don and Steve, you're up. Okay, well, camera's on, here we go. Uh, thank you for all of that gloom and doom. Uh, <laughs> and I wanna say that uh, your message is not lost on me uh, because uh, Washington state is kind of a bellwether for other states with regard to police reform. Uh, the state has been at it. And I think in a nutshell, Graham versus Connor has given us an objective standard for a long time. And um, objectivity, I think, is a, a wonderful thing when you get into deliberations and trying to make decisions. It's, it's, it's a marvelous thing. However, um, sometimes human nature demands subjective decision making. And that's what's happened is the Graham versus Connor outcomes have not satisfied. And the, and the case law that springs from Graham versus Connor have not satisfied the public. And so the easy answer for that is legislate around it. Um, and Washington State is a prime example where we have had um, case law, or not case law, but we've had uh, first an initiative process creating, uh, it was called I-940, that created a, a law back in 2018 that um, mandated de-escalation and mental health training for police officers, modify the liability standard for officers using deadly force, and um, created um, an independent investigations requirement for certain um, law enforcement uses of force, particularly deadly force and others. Uh, this is controlled by the state attorney general. Uh, since that time, we've had other laws enacted. Again, these are, these are ways that our communities are trying to say, um, we're not happy with the way these court outcomes come because largely the courts have found that we've acted properly more often than not. But the community says, we're going to go ahead and do this. And so through the legislature this time, they created laws that just went into effect this year. They are in effect. House Bill 1054 and 1310, uh, most particularly. Um, 1054, for example, prohibits the use of chokeholds, prohibits no-knock warrants. Uh, it creates a statewide policy for the, uh, for the training and use of canine teams, which uh, they want them to develop it. And I'm on the committee to do that. But one of the things about that, initially it said no dog, uh, no unleashed police dog may be used to apprehend or arrest any person. That law, that part was taken from the law and they created this committee to study it. Uh, at least they're doing that. Tear gas restrictions are out there. Uh, prohibition uh, for the use and acquisition of military equipment, uh, military surplus that's handed over to agencies. Uh, uh, no firearm over 50 calibers, which created quite a bit of consternation because by the state's definition of firearm, beanbag shotguns constitute a firearm. So do 40 millimeter um, less lethal launchers. And so we're in the position because the law says you can't use anything over 50 calibers. These fit the definition of a firearm. And so now a bunch of these less lethal tools are now taken out of the mix until we figure out and clear up the legislative intent. Um, and that's one of the problems when laws are created like this to get around this is sometimes there's a rush and things don't get done quite as clearly as we'd like them to be. Um, Vehicle pursuits are prohibited unless probable cause that a crime has occurred. Reasonable suspicion is not sufficient. Um, and also statewide prohibition against firing at a moving vehicle. Um, House Bill 1310 is deadly force is only authorized when necessary to protect against imminent threat of physical injury or death, period, end of statement. Exhaust all available and appropriate de and, and use de-escalation tactics. Uh, when using physical force, an officer is required to use the least amount of force necessary. So we now have a necessary standard in this. And th in other words, it's not about was the use of force required, as Graham says. It was with that particular one necessary. And was it the lowest level of force to be used? Um, and requires police officers to terminate physical, for, uh, physical force as soon as the necessity for it ends. 
And now here we get into subjective things. One person's, it's necessary for me to continue this until this person under control is. Well, no, this person's screaming and saying, I give up, but I don't see his hands. But if so, if someone's laying on their, is turtled on the ground and their hands are underneath and they're saying, I give up, I give up. At that point, you have a conflict because one person's going to say, I don't see those hands. That's still a threat. This is a dangerous crime, you know, possibly a, a rape, robbery, arson, whatever, a weapon involved crime. And now these hands are underneath there, which could possibly conceal a weapon. And so, the, you know, one person's going to see that as that's necessary and another person's not. We don't know how this is going to play out in the long run. Um, oh, and House Bill or Senate Bill 5051 just went into effect too, uh, which involves decertification officers and establishes a mandatory statewide standard to, to decertify officers. And part of the certification process now is every officer in the state is now going to be required to sign an agreement that the Criminal Justice Training Commission has access to your social media accounts. Let me repeat that. If you have a social media account, understand that in Washington state, if you're a police officer, the state Criminal Justice Training Commission is going to require you to maintain your certification. You must give them access to your social media accounts. They're not just gonna go in there and, and look at it, but what happened is this is to expedite decertification investigations. And decertification will happen now uh, when, uh, you, there's a, a certain type of violation. You have a variety of complaints, um, and there will be there's a there is a due process to it, and this is designed to speed up the due process. And instead of waiting for them to subpoena those records and wait for a response to the subpoena and stuff, so I think that if you take a look at it, these things are happening at a steady clip. We've got a duty to intervene law. So if you see an officer doing something they're not supposed to. We are now obligated to intervene. You can't just say, I didn't do it. You have to say, I tried to stop it. Um, and the state now has an office of independent investigations un operating under the governor, under the governor's control. And it can choose uh, to investigate an, an event in addition to whatever the agency does or whatever other investigations are to it. So um, these things are, are happening. And like I said, um, we can call Washington State a bellwether, a harbinger, or a canary in the coal mine. You can use whatever metaphor you like, but I think that we are evidence of a tide, a trend that we need to get ahead of as a community. The law enforcement community and the police canine community have an opportunity to go ahead and show that we can be responsive to our community standards. And as Gene pointed out, different states, different circuits um, have different community standards. And in the end, uh, the one thing, even in a, in, a, in a state where you have, or in a, um, say, a federal court jurisdiction where you have standards that are very different from Washington's, it may not work out that way for long if a major urban center has enough voting power and weight to go ahead and shift laws. Uh, Washington state is such a state where the western part of the state and they basically the three counties surrounding Seattle um, outweigh the rest of the state in voting. And so basically everybody follows that, even though the communities in Eastern Washington uh, see things substantially differently. Um, and I think I'm just gonna touch on a couple of things because, because this is a response to case law and, and the court's not satisfying people, these, these laws that are coming up. When we try to make our arguments for why we do things the way they are, um, understand that appeals to case law, appeals to existing jurisprudence will not satisfy the, the critics. We have to realize they're looking at something else and they're very dissatisfied with that and they want something else. In addition, I'm gonna say, kind of wrap this up. Also understand that stats to them are not persuasive. Statistics don't matter to them because narratives are crafted as Gene read to you. They, they, have very, they use a single incident and talk about this incident, which may be an aberration. It may be one, for example, that an officer was disciplined for, but it can be used uh, to represent the, all, the whole of the law enforcement canine community. And so when Gene titled this thing, are you one bite away from going to jail? I think it's a fair, um, it's a fair title because it, the body of your work will be irrelevant when one aberrant event causes a calamity and you can do your best and and do everything you can to to perform the best you can 
and I think that's that's where this whole all boils down to. The doom and gloom that came with this initial presentation and what I'm telling you right now is I don't think it's the end of canine. I do think that what it is instead is a call for us to rethink the way we do things, rethink the way we get our dogs, rethink the way we train them, rethink the way we deploy them, and we have to figure out what we have to do to um, stay within our community's expectations of us. And um, it's not clear yet exactly what that's going to look like. But if we work with them and we work with our own bosses and say, look, we're trying our best to get this better, um, I think you can get the benefit of some doubt on some things that way and move forward. Uh, I have been doing this you know, for, for my entire adult life. Uh, I've been in and out of canine multiple times, and this is my final stint. I'm getting ready to retire from law enforcement, and I am proud of what we do. And if it sounds like I'm not, please understand me. I love police canine. This is my sole reason. That, in fact, this is why I'm 13 years late retiring. And the reason I, I, I want to bring this up is I have faith that the people who do this want to do it right. If we can find out what they expect of us, we can figure out a way to do that. There is more than one way to skin this cat. We just have to listen, be responsive, and then let them know, get help, give them the information they need to make informed decisions. When you take police dogs out as a tool, of, uh, a less lethal tool at the end of a search, then that's one, one less thing available to you between what officers have on their sides at that moment and deadly force. Just let them know that that's what they face when they do that. Things like that are, are going to happen. Uh, there's going to be these discussions that are uncomfortable. People don't want it. And sometimes the negotiations will lead to an, uh, a, lot of, a lot of conflict in the process. But if we come into this with our hearts in the right place and we really do the best we can training our dogs, like Gene displayed here, then we'll come out of this in good shape. So I say train hard, work easy, and listen. Be curious about what's going on and listen. And I'm going to pass it on. Dan, Don, who's next? Oh, we got Dr. Furland. All right. Hello, gang. How are you? So first off, you know, I want to take a deep breath with you because we just got a whole lot of information from Gene. We got a whole lot of information from Steve. I want to thank Don with the USPCA for getting this to us. Gene, your videos and your bullet point slideshow was just terrific. But, you know, I wrote some notes here, and I'm going to talk about some of the takeaways that I got that I wanted to share, and I wanted to give a kind of a, a smaller agency perspective uh, coming from my experiences as to what your clues or, you know, what your briefing uh, what your alarm ringing or whatever you want to call it uh, has landed with me. So, you know, first off, I want to let those that are here know that I applaud you for caring and for taking the time to uh, get educated on, on what is going on. It means, it means to me that you care about uh, police canines, you care about your community's safety, and you are uh, deeply interested in making sure that you are doing the right things, even during this period of change, uh, you really wanna do the right things. And I applaud you for having that initiative and doing that. So first off, thank you for doing that. And second, I wanna point out to you that, <clears throat> you know, nobody in this panel over, these, over the last few months when we do this every month is making anything off of this. <clears throat> in fact, um, um, uh, Steve is the last one to retire uh, out of our group. So we don't represent a department. We're not making any money. We don't have any agendas other than we are just trying to give you straight talk as to where police canines are and where they are likely to move into the future so that you can position yourself ahead of that. So that like Gene says, you're not the one in those videos. You're not the one uh, getting arrested. You're not the one getting sued. You can get yourself ahead of the game and hopefully bring your cohorts and your, tra and your fellow uh, training group along uh, in your um, experience that you're getting today. So my takeaways are some, something like this. One, 
You know, we're talking about use of force dogs, aren't we? We're not talking about search dogs for bombs. We're not talking about the drug detection dogs. We're not really talking about those. We're talking about the use of force dogs. And, you know, if you have a smaller agency and you have a dog as a force multiplier or, you know, some sort of protection tool, well, I think that you better damn well make sure that you're devoting the proper training time for that part of the tool. You better make sure that you have good deployment policy. You better make sure that your training is scenario based upon your policies. Meaning that if you're training at a group training academy and they are doing scenario based training, you need to make sure that the scenario based training that's going on in that group is also compliant with your policy because we know from muscle memory that the dog, that you, the handler or the dog team is going to perform very similar to the way they trained. One reason why Gene showed that video where the guy is saying, good boy, good boy, good boy, as the dog is biting that person. And I'm sure the handler doesn't even know he's saying, good boy, good boy, good boy, because in training, he's encouraging the dog to bite and hold, right? And so you say, good boy, good boy, good boy. Well, that becomes muscle memory in training. And then all of a sudden now when we're deploying the dog, we're saying, good boy, good boy, good boy. And so we better make sure that the training we're having is scenario based upon your policy. You better make sure you have quality trainers doing this. You better make sure they have quality testing. That's making sure that at least once a year, your dog is being evaluated. And I say by a neutral and independent uh, testing organization. It's fine to have vendor training. It's fine to have vendor testing. It's fine to have your academy training and your academy testing, but you should also seek out some sort of neutral independent testing that's going to be able to validate that what you're doing is according to at least minimum standards. And then lastly, I'm going to kind of leave with this. You know, 99% of your work probably is search dog work. You're probably using the dog to find something, someone, something along the lines, maybe PR work your dog is doing too. But, you know, we, I guess the question is, do some of these small agencies or do even some of the larger agencies, do you even need the use of force dog? I mean, what do you have the dog doing most of the time? And why do you have the dog to begin with? And if it's not really for the use of force tool, well, maybe you can need to look seriously as to how much training is going into the use of force part of the dog that you might be able to devote into perhaps the search dog part of the dog. So listen, there's a need for the use of force dogs. There's no doubt about it. I just think that this offers an opportunity for you to revisit the decision-making that occurred when the dog was first obtained and to find out, hey, do I really need to have that type of dog in my agency? And can I, out of my smaller budget, be able to support the training that's going to be necessary to have an effective use of force type of dog. So, you know, we live in a time where mistakes, honest mistakes are being treated as criminal acts. We need to pretend that we are forward thinkers. We need to act like forward thinkers. We need to think like risk managers. And like I said, we need to figure out where we're going to be five years from now and you trying to get there now so that you are ahead of the curve. So be forward thinking. And I think Gene said something really good. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. You know, and that brings in the whole thing about police ethics, does it not? And we've heard everything about police ethics. You were tested on it when you were entering the field. You were given a whole dose of it when you were in the police academy. Hopefully you've gotten some reinforcement into that or uh, in your police department itself about ethics, because ethics is really helpful in negotiating the gray area of the laws. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. I think there was some really brilliant stuff said by by, by Gene and Steve, and I'm really looking forward to, I, I guess Scott is following me, and I'm really looking forward to uh, Scott kind of bringing this up. So thank you, everyone. Is that me? Am I up? <laughs> okay, I guess so. So can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, first of all, 
Thanks to everybody who's who's been uh, been on today. Um, thanks, Gene. That was an amazing presentation. It really took us um, through where we've gone in the past here and where we are now, and kind of brings to light the risks um, that we all face or that the line officers face. Not us, not us that are retired. Um, so I want to talk about a few things, uh, and I'm really glad everybody's kind of hanging in there. Um, I, pre I appreciate it. It, it. It's well worth the wait, I think, to, to hear everybody out and kind of exchange ideas. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I'm going to talk about policy versus uh, current law. Um, so the shift of pol public policy. And a lot of us don't talk about or haven't heard since we've been in school about public policy and how it shifts and changes the the, the consciousness and the the discourse in this country, but it's worth talking about with canine. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit, little bit about things you can do now to make a difference. So you hear all the conversation, but the, I think the bottom, you want some bottom line too. feedback from this group is like, okay, I get it, but what do we do now? What, how can we change? And I think that's some things that you need to, to have um, some discussion points about it. And I, I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, you're all here for a reason. You're here because you're leaders. Whether you're formal leaders in your organization or whether you're just personal leaders, uh, um, you know, not just alpha males, but personal, you have a leadership stake in your organization or in your community or in your group, your training group or whatever it is, um, you're a leader. And as a leader, you're out seeking the best information that you can to help your um folks, whoever's under you, whoever you, you have influence over. So hopefully you're able to take some of this, not just use it for personal growth and personal change, but impact your organization and impact other organizations. We're doing this to try to impact the um, national conversation on canine, and you have a responsibility really uh, as leaders to make a difference in your organization and in your spheres of influence, whatever they may be. So uh, we all appreciate that you're that you're here and that you're involved in those roles. Um, let me talk about public policy. Uh, public policy is the evolution of principles, uh, often unwritten, which actually are the basis for laws. So, for example, when when the when the society is ready for a a major shift in constitutional law, the way it generally works is that the, the, the Supreme Court will catch up with it, but it will not lead it, okay? That's, that's an important concept in law. The Supreme Court, the, the final adjudicator uh, of law, um, it catches up with public policy. So what you're seeing now is a shift in public policy on the use of canine. Over time, very now it seems to be like it's a compressed time frame law is going to catch up and that's what you see happening in uh new jersey new york uh washington dc has put out um, some edicts on force um and including canine and as we talked as we just heard uh, washington is a um is a bellwether you know state and we're hearing right now what's happening there and that it couldn't be more extreme so how can you make changes to help protect your organization or protect you personally? How do you stay out of trouble? How do you not be in the tidal wave of this change where everyone's caught off guard, officers are arrested or prosecuted and, and videos are released and everyone's surprised or you know concerned because they keep referencing back to Graham and saying everything's fine under Graham. Um, when in fact, Graham is changing, Graham is shifting and public policy on Graham and Force is completely shifting. So uh, let me jump into that for a minute. Um, 2020 hindsight is back. Okay, if everyone hasn't uh, kind of seen that from what we've talked about, 2020 hindsight is back. If, and I guarantee the majority of agencies in this country uh, sit in the back row, you know, like uh, veteran officers and just, uh, well, that's too bad, that's too bad, that's not the law. That's not our policy. Well, you don't want to be caught in that back row seat, um, ignoring the law of policy. You don't want to be the guy trying to write into a uh, use into a report on a bite or or a questionable use of force, 
and justifying what it is because you can justify it under Graham. You don't want to be that person anymore. Look at the New Jersey, uh, the um, uh, Arizona case we just saw. Um, how does a sergeant, and, and during canine, we, we um, uh, review canine cases and videos regularly. Why and how supervisors can stand by and watch some of these videos and things that are going on and have complete uh, like indifference to what's happening um, and watch a dog being used on a person who's not resisting, for example, and it happens all the time across the country and it's still happening. How they can do that and not be aware that there's a problem and I'm, I'm, I'm a big leadership person. I'm a big uh, leadership accountability person. I watch these videos oftentimes from the perspective of, of the supervisor and the organization leadership. How it, it, It's really shocking to me that even now, supervisors can allow these things to occur and not instinctually realize that there's a problem. And then the organization, once it becomes an issue or it's on CNN or whatever, the organization stands behind... Uh, their systems and and just merely refers back to the handler or the or the, or the supervisor instead of realize that there that there is a problem and trying to affect some kind of change to protect the cops because it's all going to come down on the officer that's using force so um let's talk a little bit about uh this the uh gram and how it's changing and everyone knows it's changing and you instinctually know it know it's changing it's just you're not quite sure where it's heading but you already know there's three things that you've heard that you know are creeping into policy that are changing the objective reasonableness floor of policy policy uh, of use of force policy. Necessary standards are coming in all over, whether they're in deadly force or whether they're just put into force. A necessary standard is a subjective standard. What's necessary to you is not necessary to me. Proportionality. Proportionality will be part of, at least in public policy, all assessments of force, when a uh, jury, although they're working with the law, which is a grand based law in the federal system, uh, they will always have an eye towards what's proportional. That's the fairness in us. If you're putting a dog on a handcuffed suspect, that's not fair. That's not proportional to the resistance. And now that that's part of the national public policy is that force needs to be proportional that's going to be a large component of it. The other large public policy component that's in law enforcement and is never going away uh, and will eventually make it across the country to every police department is de-escalation. De-escalation is here to stay. And even if your policy does not have a clear de-escalation policy and training component, which it should start to at least assess and implement, it's part of the public policy discussion and it's part of that, that uh, conversation. So I will say this, ask yourself when you're looking at your canine policy or you're at operations, um, you're at training, you're at regional training with your dog, you're witnessing a, a dog bite, you're using, you're deploying your dog, you're simply deploying your dog on a situation or a directed deployment bite, use of force bite. Does that help or hurt? Is it proportional to the resistance? And does it help to de-escalate or escalate the force? Does it cause more force to occur or less force to occur? If you don't start applying that particular standard in your own personal and organizational assessments, the public is going to do that. And as, as you've noticed, uh, waiting until the quote, wait, until the investigation is done before we discuss it or release our findings is no longer okay in the eyes of the community. That's another element of public policy is they're not going to wait for us to be done. They did two years ago, two, three years ago, you had a bad shooting. You had a questionable video come out and the response, the rote response was always and reasonably, look, we understand this, but this has bad optics. We're conducting an investigation we will get back to you when the investigation is done. We have to give everyone due process. Uh, we can't act off a uh, two-dimensional image on video. We have to assess the real video and there's four other body cam videos. We have to investigate before we, we speak. 
If you haven't noticed, that's no longer okay with the public. That's why major organizations are now releasing body camera footage like within 24 hours. They're doing what they can to contain it, uh, but they're releasing the footage and they're having the conversation with the community and letting everyone know, know what's going on. We are not in control of the conversation anymore when it comes to force and critical incidents. The community has demanded to be involved. Over the years, we've said, no, we'll get back to you when our investigation is done. And the community has said, no, <laughs> that's not going to work for us. And as you've seen, videos are now being released right away. And if they're not, they're being forced to be released because body our uh, YouTube video, like cell phone video is being released and they're having to now come up with their own video and control their own conversations from the department side. So they're having to release their own video and, and talk about what happened. Then they can say, okay, we're, we're, um, we're investigating. We understand we have the video, it's been released. Here it is to channel three or whatever. Uh, the police department is formally going to give a, an, a, an announcement about it in conversation and control the, the release of the video. And now we're going to play it for you. Here it is. But the investigation is ongoing. We're not going to do anything administrative until it's done. Even that is not happening anymore. Officers are being terminated now when a chief or executive officer believes that there's cause for termination. They're being suspended uh, quicker now than they would have been before. For example, I use Los Angeles because they try to stay ahead of the public policy curve. They, really, they now release the video immediately and keep it as controlled a conversation as they can. But the officer is suspended administratively um, and is kept within the confines of an administrative process. But there are agencies that are firing cops the day of the incident. I think um, Gene spoke about one, maybe a couple of them. Uh, these cops are being terminated without consideration of due process because that's what the community is demanding. And these are not just, you know, liberal communities, uh, blue communities. Um, these are, this is everywhere. Um, the, the public is demanding accountability like never before. And that's why we're, we're here. So what can you do now? What does this all mean for you? There's always, there's a lot of uh, these conversations and you've, you've been patient and listened, but what does this mean? What do you do is really the question. I will tell you this. Number one is your policy has to comport with what the community expects of you. Your, your behavior in the field has to comport with what the community expects of you. And that's kind of a universal loose term. But if, you're going, if your video of your bite on TV tonight on CNN is going to cause you to be suspended or terminated, you just need to stop doing it. And you can't wait for your department to change your policy and for case law to come down to tell you to do it and for the Supreme Court to tell you to do it, which is kind of what we've been doing, right? No, no, Graham is, is the rule and we're, we're not interested in what everyone else has to say. We find it to be objectively uh, reasonable and therefore we're good to go. That's not really working anymore. Graham has shifted and policy is being taking a long time to catch up with Graham. So, you can help prod your organization to shift policy and start paying a little bit more attention to where this is going and help you and then support that ch policy change with training uh, and keep keep your uh, your handlers out of trouble. But realistically, personally, if it was me, uh, I, have been, I haven't had a dog since the 80s when things were much different, but they weren't that different. If you knew that what you were doing was highly problematic and there was a film crew uh, or not, you just really needed to shift your, your behavior. And if you're debriefing and four other handlers were there and you didn't shift your behavior, they would shift it for you. They'd have that conversation with you, like you're gonna get us all in trouble, um, so you better you know lock your heel, they would lock your heels. So what can you do now? Let's talk about some basic, basic um, career survival things in canine. Consider using, now I know, the reaction is we already do this, but consider using a gram factors for deploying the dog. Not your own su subjective uh, criteria for deploying the dog. I I've reviewed, um, and for work, um, I review a lot, of, a lot of canine policies. And 
most of them are, they try to mirror Graham to some degree, but they don't specifically base the, the deployment of the dog. And I mean, pulling them out of the car and sending them on a search uh, on or off lead on Graham. If your use of force factors and your deployment factors completely match up, when you deploy the dog, you're gonna be in a lot better place. So when you deploy the dog, considerations of severity, level of resistance, uh, likelihood of escape, uh, the basic, co basic components of Graham. If the severity of the crime doesn't match, if the level of threat this person uh, exhibits um, or the likelihood of escape, um, you want to really, really rethink. Now, that should be the basis of a deployment um, a criteria policy, but then you're going to need to have the other components that don't keep it a bare bones policy. But, but also don't have it as a crime was committed and a dog can be used to find him reasonably and then deploy the dog because then you're going to, you might have a bite, correct? You might have a, uh, a contact bite. When the dog locates him, you're going to have a bite. Now, you didn't make the decision. So what's happened in Los Angeles was, was one example of where um, they're, not, they're not judging the bite as a force specifically because the officer didn't make the decision. The, dog, the officer merely deployed the dog. The dog reacted in a certain way to the, to the suspect's actions and then uh, got a bite. Okay, well, that's mildly interesting. That was okay for a few years, and now officers are being, um, are being um, uh, held accountable for the deployment with the likelihood that that dog was going to bite. And so there's a, there's been a disconnect with policies that don't quite put that together. So just clean it up and make your deployments uh, or consider, look at your policy and see if it'll work, but make it uh, gram based your deployment and make sure you have a gram based uh, criteria for direct deployment. When you send the dog on a specific suspect, make sure it's based on use of force concepts. I've seen policies where the bite is written based solely on a separate uh, canine policy that doesn't speak to grand concepts, even though the grand concepts are part of the use of force policy in the department. So you're using two different overlapping, sometimes conflicting policies to support a bite or, or a certain action. And so you wanna clean all that up so that your officers, the, the point is that your officers are working under a clean, concise, uniform, consistent policy for when to deploy the dog, when it when it deployment criteria and directed deployment criteria for a bite. Everything is clean, consistent. And then thirdly, that all of that is supported in training, timely training, that your trainers are on board with these changes um, and that you, uh, you basically are operating under the department's policy. Speaking of training, let's talk about um, uh, your um, bites that are uh, your recall versus your verbal out. Uh, your hard outs. Let's talk about that for a second. So this and duration of bite are the two other, the other thing I want to talk about. Um, the recall versus a hard out is a big one. So here's one of the main questions, and this is, uh, you know, from the attorney side of me too. The question for you is, do you train, so you had a circumstance where the dog was deployed and you have articulation in there as to why you delayed, um, 10, 20 seconds, a minute, till you got your vest on, to whatever you did, did to do to, to make that approach because a suspect could be dangerous. Okay, so you spent this time uh, uh, gearing up and then you made your deployment out of the dog. You did a hard or tactile out because that's the way it's done in your organization. Okay, how do you certify? Do you certify to that, that standard? Uh, yeah, sure, we do that. Okay, do you, do you ever certify for a verbal out? Do you ever call the dog off in training, certified training? Well, yeah, we have to, and the standard response is, we have to do that in certification. That's the rope, that's the standard response I hear from people. We have to do that to certify. Okay, so you train. Certification is essentially the culmination of your training to, uh, to meet a, a particular standard. And yet in the field, you don't apply that training or you don't apply that standard. Uh, and every time we do these assessments or talk to handlers, it's always like a, a confusion, like, well, you know, it depends. Okay, it depends, but do you ever recall the dog verbally from a bite? And nine out of 10 times, the response is, well, we haven't really done that for safety reasons. 
Okay, so you might want to reassess that. That's another another recommendation that uh, I am strongly making to you is that you reassess whether you are able to um, recall the dog off a bite reasonably and safely. And if you can do it, do it. We all know that your dog will do it. If your dog will not recall off a bite in the field, remove him from the field because he needs to be able to recall off a bite. But we all know your dog's not stupid. He knows he's not in certification or in training. He's not in, in, uh, in regional training. He's in the field. He's in, under circumstances that are different. And in this field, he doesn't recall off the bite. He waits for you to come up, approach, you know, and yell commands and do what you're going to do and remove him after, you know, 30 seconds or a minute or sometimes longer. Um, so you may have trouble getting him off. So you may want to start working on that. The video showing the um, hard out without real objective uh, supporting rationale is what's getting people in trouble. That's part of what's getting people in trouble. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time, so I'm going to keep jumping ahead. Um, pain compliance. If you're here's here's what I would recommend you consider as a as a policy, and whether it's in writing or not, you may want to consider it for your own career survival. If using the dog under under non exigent circumstances, and I don't mean man with a gun, man reaching for a gun, uh, under non exigent circumstances. If your use of the dog in directed deployment, which is literally placing the dog on or sending, is going to create more drama, don't do it. Okay. In other words, is the use of the dog for pain compliance proportional to the resistance? So he's fighting two cops that are trying to handcuff him or three cops that are trying to handcuff him. Is using the dog going to hurt or help? Help or hinder? getting him into custody? Is it going to be a benefit? And how is it going to be a benefit? Now, the standard response, we've all had it from the 80s on or whenever, well, it's a distraction technique and it takes his mind off being able to fight the uh, uh, resisting. And so we're able to pull his hands behind his back. That language in reports is very rote and it's um, not really all that supported because the other side of the coin is using the dog is causing him to fight more. Okay, so you're not de-escalating and it may not be proportional to the to the actual resistance. So keep that in mind. When you're using the dog for a pain compliance, consider whether it's going to help get him in custody or it's going to hinder getting him into custody. It's going to cause more drama for the, for the cops that have to fight. I don't think I've seen in numerous videos where the dog is put during a, a, a you know a dog pile where they're trying to put the so to speak when they're trying to get the guy in the cuffs when the dog is inserted and we you know there's this insertion technique right where the dog's inserted for pain compliance that it's actually helped I, I don't know the number of times where they've said oh I now know that a dog has been used um, and now I'm going to stop resisting generally the person is going to fight more than they were before because no one wants to get bit. So if the dog, if the guy's gonna fight more because of the bite, you wanna consider whether you wanna use the dog. Even though everyone wants to get a bite, really that's not what it's about anymore. It's about staying staying out of the trouble and keeping canine. Because there are agencies we've already heard are losing their dogs. Um, there's, there's agencies that have already talked about disbanding. It's just not worth the headache to them because it costs money to run a dog program and it's high liability. Um, and where years ago, no one really cared or paid attention they are now. Um, I'm part of um, a consent decree assessment team for a couple of organizations with the Department of Justice. And I can tell you that uh, canine units have been very fortunate to have been left out of the mix when it comes to uh, Department of Justice oversight. They go through the policy and they want to make sure you have a policy. Is there a policy and is it consistent with Graham and the rest of the policies? And if you do, they kind of leave you alone. And I have a feeling that that's not going to be the case anymore. I have a feeling that in the future, consent decrees will now have a canine component and they might be uh, uh, cause uh, issues of concern for, uh, for police officers and for, for canine units. So again, we're talking about shifting public policy. 
things are changing. So keep up with the times and make sure you keep yourselves and others out of trouble. Um, hard out versus recall certified. I just want to go through my list. Duration of fight. Same thing. If you've been in a fight, everyone in here has been, a, been, a, been on a fight. 30 seconds is a long, long, long time. A minute is a lifetime, right? Being Imagine being bit by a mal for a minute while you're putting your gear and your jacket on and suiting up and the whole thing's on video. Um, I, I've seen three minute bites that the handler justified, the supervisors were present for and justified, and the department tried to justify. And there was no justifying a three minute bite when the guy was, um, you know, a, uh, 100 feet away in the middle of the street with his hands up and the entire organization was trying to support this bite on um, the duration of this bite too which was uh not not really something they could support and that's in, it's a case that's in litigation but it gives an example of the duration of bite a bite is, can be a very long a long process for a guy trying to surrender and uh, he's saying if he's yelling okay 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 and the dog's still on him you have a problem that's a good rule of thumb <clears throat> um, so I think that's the, uh, that's it. I kind of went through everything I want to talk about, but I just wanted to make sure I reemphasize, <clears throat> consider where public policy is now compared to where your agency policy is. And for whatever position you're in now, how can you help uh, change that? How can you help prevent problems for the organization and keep your cop, your cops out of, uh, out of trouble uh, and out of jail? Uh, thank you. I appreciate your, your, your listening. Thanks, Scott. Uh, before we go to questions, I'd like to um, recognize John Kerwick is the recently retired um, commander of the largest canine program in the city of New York. And uh, he's here somewhere, but I don't know where he went because everybody's moving around on the, sh on the ship here. Let's go to questions. We've got a couple interesting ones. There's uh, someone from Phoenix. His question is, is there is anyone here currently or in the past been the subject of a consent consent decree? If so, what changes were made, if any? I think Scott could probably respond because he's in charge of Cleveland PD uh, handling the consent decree for DOJ. And then, of course, Steve White, who just left, Seattle was a subject to a consent decree, so he'd be a good one to get a hold of. But Scott? Yeah, um, I'm an assistant monitor with uh, with uh, Cleveland's um, system, and and they've made they've made significant strides um, in their consent decree and in just changing. They really have. They've they've done just a remarkable job. And and I just I don't I don't mean to get off question, but the consent decree oftentimes. If I'm just real quick on the consent decrees. Everybody hates a consent decree. They're awful. They're terrible. The the, they don't know what they're doing. Their lawyers are well. That's not always the case. Oftentimes, the organization, um, everyone knows Chuck Ramsey is. He was a um, chief of D.C. and of Philadelphia. When, when Ramsey went to uh, D.C., he did something kind of remarkable, but kind of against the current. He brought in the Department of Justice. He invited them in because he knew they were starting to look at D.C. So he invited them in to do an assessment. And that saved him a tremendous amount of grief. They went in and they did an assessment and they worked hand in hand with Chief Ramsey to change the organization in several ways. And uh, Ramsey's involved in a lot of uh, a lot of consent decrees around the country. Um, but what, what often happens is the consent decree shows some issues in the police department and they try to work, they try, and Steve White will laugh, they try to work kind of with the department with the findings of a department of the DOJ investigation, and they try to make the organization better, okay? And they try to work with the police department. And sometimes the police department isn't having it, and they're really resisting. But in the end, they always end up um, complying, but usually in partnership with the DOJ. So has it made a difference? Yes. And I can tell you what Cleveland's pol uh, canine policy is, because I was involved in uh, helping put, put all those policies together. Their use of force policy, is the force has to be uh, necessary to a, uh, a lawful uh, objective. That's their necessary component. It's not some guy's uh, assessment that the force itself is necessary, but 
the, the use of the force has to be necessary to a, to a lawful objective, which is exactly right. It does need to be necessary to doing something, right? It can't be arbitrary or, you know, or, or, or some other way. It has to be proportional and it has to be reasonable. That, that's a good policy that's not all Graham. It's a basic policy that's just a, a above Graham enough. So now in applying that and using that, and I look at their use of force cases in, in applying that standard to their use of force cases, it's much easier to adjudicate than just objectively reasonable based on you know, the department's assessment of whether it's reasonable or not based on their own members' training and experience. It's a little bit higher standard than that, but it, it really works because you look at it in a three, three tier system. Was the force necessary to accomplish an objective? Yes, he was running from the police after a crime. He had to be arrested and he didn't, resi- he didn't uh, submit to arrest, it was necessary. Was it proportional? He was tackled and handcuffed. So yeah, it was, and this is why. Was it reasonable? Then you cover, yes, any similarly trained o- a Cleveland officer under same cir- or like circumstances would have, you, would have uh, re- been able to rely on that force option um, based on their training and experience. So the use of um, the DOJ has made some positive changes Nobody likes them. Everybody uh, wants to uh, kind of, um, you know, begrudge what what the systems have done, but they really have made some significant changes with organizations. Um, And I think most large departments have actually had them now. LA had it. I was with the Consent Decree Bureau in um, and did the use of force stuff in LA under the Consent Decree. And they changed everything. Everything was changed. And I'm going to tell you, it's changed for the better. It's changed for the better. Otherwise, we'd still be operating under this rogue policy, um, old, old antiquated system that would be that would be putting us in jail now. That would be catching us, catching us up and stuff. So I don't know if I if I answered it, but the DOJ has made positive differences, and it really shouldn't be feared. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll leave you with this: if the DOJ comes in, or the state uh, DOJ, um, if they come in and they're invited in, or they do an investigation. That can help you make force the department to make those policy changes that you and your heart know need to be changed. So if you know that we really shouldn't be doing this anymore, but your leadership supports it, the guys in the back of the room, the old guys still want to do it, but you know it's wrong, and and uh, inquiry in, by the DOJ or intervention of some kind will help shift those policies so that you're kind of in the right direction. So I, I hope that I hope that helped without too much rambling. And if I can respond also to the lieutenant from Phoenix that asked that, there's also one level be below consent. And one of my client cities, the city of Inglewood, here in Southern California, went through that. Uh, there was a DOJ sent their monitors out. We were able to convince them not to enter into a consent decree, but it was more like we received a letter of, uh, of assistance where they went through everything and we agreed to change, you know, use of force policy, canine policy, protest training, whatever it was. And it's going to cost your agency money, but many times that money is well spent because you're going to get improved training. You're going to get improved equipment. You're going to get improved policy. So like Scott says, I went in there with this negative attitude, like, let's go to war. Well, you're never going to win against the feds. They have more money and more people than you will ever have. So change that mindset and realize, okay, can we get something less than a consent decree and we still improve, but you will spend money uh, in order to improve things, which is not a bad thing. So that's my experience that there are a variety of ways to do it. And you just got to sit down and you literally will sit down at a table with them and go over things and arrive and agree. And you have a right to disagree and say, no, we do it for this way. And they may or may not agree with you, but it is a negotiation process. And I think Scott would probably agree with that yeah the, the letter the letter of um, the letter of technical assistance is your yeah. best bet if, if your 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 agency can negotiate that um, that's good if, but if your agency refuses to comply and refuses to acknowledge the investigation outcomes from the DOJ it's based on investigation if they refuse to uh, embrace it they don't even waste time they go into court and they get a consent decree which is just a federal order that you will do it so yeah, that's the best best bet is you can get a technical assistance because then they'll give you full federal resources to help you accomplish the goals that you need to, to make, you know, that you know need to be done. Thanks guys. We have a question for Gene. 
what is the number one procedure or process that canine units could change to help some of your past cases? I think I answered that in the chat box. And one of them is like Scott said, tightening up your policy procedures. The other one, and this will probably meet with the most resistance, is changing your policy to call the dog off at the earliest possible opportunity when the handler determines it is safe to do so. There are so many cases coming out now saying that the the bite itself, the actual apprehension may be okay, but if the dog is on the bite too long, that in and of itself becomes the excessive force component. Now, people are going to say, well, God, I call my dog off too, uh, too fast. They're going to pull out a gun and we're going to get a shooting. Well, my experience with L.A. County Sheriff's Department, which is a 10,000-strong deputy uh, agency and patrols uh, some of the toughest parts of L.A. and their 12-member canine unit, and LAPD, which is another 10,000 person strong agency that has some pretty tough areas. That has not been the case. There have not been officer involved shootings or deputy involved shootings for calling the dog off too soon. And I heard all those arguments. Oh my God, Gene, the sky is gonna fall down. On the contrary, the nature and extent of our injuries are actually minimized and reduced because we're calling that dog off much sooner. So they're less ripping and less tearing of the dog. Uh, it's more like, it's more puncture wounds, which makes it easier for me to defend when I have to show those photos to the jurors and or judge. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, while we're waiting for another question, a reminder that Scott has done a presentation that's on the USPCA uh, uh, YouTube page. Uh, it's about policies. It's what, when something goes wrong in the canine program, what are the usual causes? Uh, Lou Ferland and John Kerwick have done one on supervisory uh, issues and small departments. Gene has just did this one here. And Steve White, who has left, uh, did some uh, a, a really nice program on training to tactics and not training to certification type stuff. So it's been pretty good. All those are on our YouTube, on our YouTube page. Does anybody have anything else? Hey there, you got a quick moment? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. Go ahead, Andrew. Hey, this is Officer Yeldington, Colorado Springs Police Department Canine. Um, so quick question. So like you said, Graham v. Connor is kind of changing on whether, you know, to deploy or not. So minimization of injury, other less lethal options. But so in regards to the severity of the crime, how do you guys weigh like a fresh warrant assault with a deadly weapon compared to a FTA or Failure to FT, failure to comply or failure to appear on assault with a deadly weapon. Go ahead, Scott. I see you're ready to say something. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm, you know, we're lawyers. We need more facts. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so, if you have an assault with a deadly weapon, fresh warrant, he hasn't been arrested yet. You know, he poses more of a threat, whereas opposed to if it's a, he already got arrested and he didn't go to court or he didn't comply with a condition. I kind of look at that potentially as more of a court order violation as opposed to just the actual crime itself. So how do you how do you distinguish the two whether deciding to deploy a dog or not where you know this potential you know this person could potentially get bit by a dog and you know obviously get injuries from that? Uh, my perspective it's cumulative so it depends on your circumstance. So now you're talking about executing an arrest warrant, a felony arrest warrant for assault at the person's home. Uh, he's refusing to come out or is he in the yard or is he running through? I mean, what are your circumstances? Because what you just said is certainly grounds to um, consider the seriousness of the crime that he's being apprehended for, which is the, the assault. That's the warrant for it. So, but I don't know the circumstances of the deployment of the search. Okay. And it, yeah, obviously it's case by case basis and totality of circumstance, but do you see where I'm coming from where you have the fresh warrant as opposed to he just didn't go to court. Now it's a failure to appear, but he still committed that original crime. And I, I know it's a pretty general question. No, I, I, I think it's a good question to, uh, it's a good, it's a good um, debriefing question. So if you put it up to people and have that conversation regularly, you're going to get to the point where people are going to know what to do. And that's part of being a leader is that you put these things out. This is an example maybe has not had occurred, has not, has occurred in a neighboring jurisdiction. So what LA did does now is we debrief everything involving us or not. There was a bite, guy hiding in bedroom, warrant, fresh warrant. Uh, it was a, an assault warrant occurred uh, six months ago and now we're executing it because we found him. But we know that crime was a deadly force 
you know, related incident and the guy has carried a gun, would you deploy on that? And I think it, again, uh, you know, we're not going to, can't speak to the specifics of that case because we don't have, still don't have enough. I need to have the smoke in the air and the smell and the helicopters overhead to think through that as a, you know, but, um, you know, yeah, it's a consideration, it's a consideration, right? But if you're using Graham, you're using a very clear standard. Like I'm going to pull the dog out of the car and send him. Let's say the guy ran into the yard. He might be in the garage. You have a warrant. You have a felony warrant. The guy used a gun. He's got a history of being armed. So there, you, you're starting to at least build using a very well-known specific policy of Graham. Not one of these policies that said the guy's wanted for a serious crime and the likely uh, the, the, the use of a dog is likely to be effective. Okay, I don't know what that policy means, but I read them all the time. But if you have a clear Graham-based criteria to work with, at least you know you're working through those steps then you can use some of the other considerations like nothing else will work, no, nothing else will be feasible, whatever. But that you just need to look at your policies and see what's working and what's not working. But uh, that, that's worthy of discussion during a, a debrief and conversation in your, your department's policies. Hey, Andrew, this is uh, John Kerwick here. I just had one quick comment on your question. It's a great one. But we just sat here with some really knowledgeable people and discussed that split second decision and didn't come up with a good answer. And, and that's why I think no matter what policy you have, that instead of just having it in the book, that we actually bring trainers into that policy and train scenario-based training to the cops with their policy. The days of just saying, send the dog out, do a hit, come on back, call them off or over. I think once we get through a basic school, it's time to have the decision fall on the police officer who's deploying the dog for his own protection. And once he gets used to that, he'll be less likely to make a mistake instead of just being in the field and going with that gut instinct like we all have done. And I think the circumstances have changed enough that we owe it to the cops to have trainers actually make cops make decisions prior to deploying their dogs, even in training they have the basics now and that way it'll reflect in the field and we'll have less cops less supervisors get hurt and like a good detective you have to build your case okay is it just a warrant how long ago was it issued how long ago was that adw situation now you arrive uh, at his house so you say screw you guys and flees off into the woods well, now we start building up the case. Did he look like he might be armed or was he wearing a, a bathing suit, no shirt? Didn't look like he was armed. Probably wouldn't use my dog. So the more facts you can add, the better case you have to deploy that dog. But you definitely need facts. And you need a good policy to be working from. You, have, you need a good policy. Cops to be competent in that policy, to have gone over it in uh, debriefing and training firm, consistent training to support that policy, and then your decision-making, um, you, you're not going to question the decision-making. Someone said the cops may question themselves uh, at some point during whatever. If you have a good, well-founded policy based on um, the expectations of the organization and the community uh, and, and best practices, those cops trained and retrained on the same policy and it's reinforced in both certification and in the field and operations, uh, you're not going to have any problems. You're going to be okay. But if you don't have those things, um, you're, 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 you're going to have a, a problem. When cops are doing things and going to jail and they don't know why, you have a problem. You, the organization, the organization has a problem. Cops go to jail all the time and they don't know why. Okay, there's a problem. That's the main problem here, is that their policy, they thought they were following policy, like the guy in um, Michigan, the Michigan State Police video, or the, the Utah one even, where they thought they were using policy and they were able to articulate it under Graham. Um, they're following policy that's putting them in trouble and the organization isn't stepping up and changing it and fixing it. So when you have good policy and good training, um, you're going to keep guys out of trouble and they're going to be confident. They're going to make good decisions in the field. Scott, you should articulate just a little bit on the use of force policy for the department and the use of force policy 
you mentioned it, the use of force policy that the canine units use, they have to be the same. They have to be the same. If you pull up your standard vendor policy that one organization, uh, vendor organization is printing out for everybody and they just change the name, sometimes they don't even change the entire name or they leave in conflicting information. You have a policy that's written based on what they need, to, what they think they need to deploy a dog. And it's not oftentimes not consistent with the department's use of force policy or state law, maybe. So every organization should pull out their use of force policy, pull out their canine policy and hold them up against each other, against the light of the window and see whether they overlap. And you'll find that most likely they don't in some way or form. So number one is again, I'm a policy guy. I, I'm big on big on policy. Um, if you want examples of like uh, little provisions of policy stuff, I can send you uh, stuff that I worked on. Uh, but you need to make sure that your your dog is a use of force tool. And as Lou spoke to, we're kind of going away from dog from dog as um, just generic uh, tool to dog as force option because that's the way they're they're perceived. Um, it'll take longer in some parts of the countries than, than others to get there. But the dog is a force option, is a, you know, is a force to force tool. Um, so your use of the dog has to be consistent with law, public policy, and your organization's policy. So you just need to pull it up and look at it. If you read, if two people read a policy and they have conflicting opinions about the outcome of a case like we just talked about, you got a problem with your policy. Pro policy should be easy to interpret uh, and any uh, interpretation should be clarified through training. It shouldn't be that hard and good supervision in the field. I'm a big leadership guy. If you've got a good supervisor that understands the policy and is not afraid to step in, not timid to step in, they will clarify the policy. Look, call the dog off, Jack. Well, the guy could be, you know, you know call him off. That's not the policy. Uh, out, poof, dog comes back to you. You put him in the car, go up, handcuff him. Turns out you were videotaped the whole time. Thank God you pulled the dog off because your policy says that you should pull the dog off. Public policy supports taking the dog off when it's not reasonable to leave them on. If you have a supervisor that supports, that understands and supports your policy, um, you're going to be way ahead of the game. So that 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 that's half of it. So making sure you have a good policy, training to it, and proper supervision that's going to enforce it is is important. Thanks, Scott. Uh, anybody else? Oh, I want to thank everybody for uh, attending this webinar. The, uh, the edited version uh, will be out in about a week and a half. And again, it'll be on the USPCA YouTube site. And thank you, everybody. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Talk to you soon. Have a good day. Yep.